Hey, hey, you're listening to the Level Up Creators podcast. Amanda Northcutt here, founder and CEO. We help digital creators and thought leaders like you turn your knowledge and experience into rock solid recurring revenue. And we are so glad you're here. Welcome. Our distinguished guest today is Catherine McGarvey, who is joining us with more than 25 years of marketing experience, working with everyone from small local businesses to major corporations and everything in between. Catherine now runs Nosy HQ based in Napier, New Zealand. She spends her days interviewing people, digitally eavesdropping, and generally engaging in wholesome snooping on behalf of her clients to help them better understand their customers, where they hang out, and what motivates them to buy. She'll tell anyone who will listen that talking to your customers and using what they tell you in your marketing is an outrageously simple way to attract, captivate, and convert exactly perfect buyers. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me, Amanda. I am so excited to have this conversation with you today. Uh, you and I have known each other for several months now, and I'm not sure I've ever come across a person so incredibly passionate about helping business owners truly understand their customers. I mean, you're eliminating all of the guesswork. You know, you're the person that comes in, talks to real people, uh, and helps business owners, like I said in the intro, actually attract, captivate, and convert their ideal clients. So we're going to get right into the meat of our conversation, and then we'll kind of unpack some details from there. So for starters, why is it so important to talk to your customers? Uh, for me, there are three primary reasons. And I guess the main one is ultimately, if you haven't got customers, you haven't got a healthy and sustainable business. So the more you know about the people who you are wanting to buy your thing uh, or use your service, the better off, uh, the better chance you have of yeah. growing your business. Um, also, it's talking to your customers is a great way of actually understanding your own business better. Uh, a quick example of that: for a few years, I styled myself as a marketing coach. And I thought what I was there for was to teach people marketing and to steer them and guide them and help them on their way. When I actually talked to those people at the end of the engagement, I wasn't actually teaching them marketing. They were with me for confidence. That's what they were buying. So despite mm. the fact that I thought this was what I was selling, it's really powerful to hear from your actual clients, the people who have given you money, what mm. they are really buying. And I guess the third reason for me is it's so much, e so much easier to sell to people when you know them really well, rather than just going in blind and, you know, as we used to say in the old days, spray and pray, you know, hoping <laughs> that things will work out. Yeah, as a matter of fact, if you actually are solving a real pervasive, painful problem, it is, and you're talking to the right person, it is much easier to help them purchase the value that they need uh, that provides a solution to their problem. So. Tell me what we can learn from customer interviews that we can't get from things like multiple choice surveys. That's such a great question. And whenever I think about surveys, I know it's not always entirely true, but I think people sometimes lie on surveys. I mm -hmm. think depending on what kind of survey, I think often people answer surveys as the person they wish they were rather than the person that they actually are. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm not always in tight. I know it's not a survey, but, you know, if my doctor says, how much exercise are you getting? Or, um, you know, how much did you drink last week? Sometimes mm -hmm. if it's in my favor, I'm going to tell them the truth. Otherwise, I might just slightly fudge it. So I think mm -hmm. that's one thing uh, that people aren't always necessarily truthful in a survey. Um, another thing is you're missing the nuance oftentimes of the human who's answering the survey. So uh, a quick example, I'm doing some work with a client at the moment. I've interviewed uh, their clients and I'm just following up their clients with a survey saying, can you rank these, fact these five factors mm -hmm. in order of importance? So it's kind of a survey. Mm -hmm. Because I've already got this prior relationship because we've had a half hour to 40 minute interview of, I think I've done nine of them so far, Four or five have come back saying it was really easy to pick the top three. The last three, there's no difference between them, but I just put them in the order. So mm -hmm. with a survey, you don't know, has somebody 
clicked straight away to say, yep, that's what I want? Or have they sat there for two minutes and really can't decide? Mm. So by doing the interviews, you're, you've got a, a higher level uh, of understanding of exactly what's going on. Surveys are great, but interviews go that little bit further. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's this qualitative and quantitative piece to it. I mean, there's quantitative to be data to be gleaned from quantitative or from surveys, right? From multiple choice surveys, especially if you can get several hundred or several thousand people to take them, you can get some important data. I love what you just said about one, people do lie on forms and surveys. <laughs> Research shows that time and time again, we've known <laughs> that for decades that people lie on forms and surveys. And that is such an interesting point that you have no idea how long someone stared at the screen before they answered that question. So the qualitative piece where you're hopefully seeing someone on a video call or speaking to them in person, video call, obviously much more realistic and likely um, in, in today's world, but you're, you're hearing their intonation, you're seeing uh, gesticulation. Are they moving their hands? Are they leaning forward? Are they sitting back? Yeah. Are their arms crossed? Like how does, how do sort of those like physical elements play into how you interview people on behalf of your clients? Well, it's interesting, Amanda, because sometimes I make phone calls and sometimes mm -hmm. I do interviews and I feel like they both have their own strengths. I find quite often with phone calls, like it's easier for people to tell something to you, especially if it's a hard truth, if they're not looking you in the eye. Mm. And you can still tell from people's voices. Are they excited? Are they slow to talk and are they thinking it through but it's undeniable on a video you know you see the people do that or you see them yeah. do that and you can you know that's an insight in itself not just the transcript the the output is how they're reacting so those are all really important clues as to how people are feeling so interesting there's so much like psychology and science i want to get into it a little bit with you but um We'll keep moving forward for the sake of this is an hour long show. <laughs> when should business owners start doing customer interviews or thinking about, you know, hiring someone like you to do it for them? Today or yesterday. <laughs> like the best time to plant a tree, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Like I'm an advocate for it as soon as you can now. Mm -hmm. What I see with my clients is the... The reason that most of them come are, you know, they're seeing a growth stall. Things aren't happening that they expected would happen. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've been tracking along doing something and it's all been going fine and then all of a sudden it's not going fine and they don't really understand why. Or also churn. You know, if they're losing customers or people aren't re-engaging and they're dropping off, it's useful to know why is that? What's what's stopping them? And interviews are really like if you can talk to somebody who's stopped using you or stopped paying for you, that's incredibly powerful. Like even one interview will tell you quite a lot and enough to hopefully start to put in place measures to stop mm -hmm. that happening. But yeah, yesterday. Yes. <laughs> That's great advice. And it's also interesting in thinking from a business owner's perspective, well, from a marketer's perspective, you can think of stages of awareness in terms of like when people come to you. So they are feeling a lot of pain, right? And they are looking for a solution to that pain. Um, but if they would have come to you just a little bit earlier, you know, in those stages of awareness that they need customer interviews, you can preempt the churn problem or the you know, growth stagnation or decline, things like that, right? That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like this should be definitely a regular sort of rhythm and, and ritual of the business. So what's the frequency that, that this should happen, like in any business? I would love to say as often as you can. Uh, there are some statistics out there from Profit World did, a, um, mm -hmm. did some research and I'm going by memory, but I'm sure it said that businesses that talk to 10 or more customers a month for the purpose of um, getting marketing insights for them grow at a rate that's two to three times faster than people that don't. So, you know, wow. it's yeah, it's, 
It's quite a mind-blowing statistic, and it's, it definitely makes a difference. But we live in the real world, and not everybody is resourced to do that. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you can, if you if you can talk to ten customers a month, that would be ideal. If it's only ten customers a quarter, that's great. Even ten customers every six months, it's mm-hmm. you know, if you can make the effort to fit it in, it's well worth it. I've never. Uh, had somebody that I've encouraged to call a customer ring me up afterwards and say that was a waste of time they ring me up so pumped at what they can learn from just one interview and you know people we don't take the time to actually do it because there are so many other things on our plate but if you can set aside the time to sit down to talk to the people who are giving you money Mm -hmm. it is most definitely going to pay off that's an incredible statistic and you know profit well is a is a credible company uh, out of boston here in the states and okay it was businesses who talk to 10 or more customers i think did you say a month yeah grow two to three times faster than businesses who don't i mean that's a massive growth lever and so oh, yeah. i think customer interviews are something uh that are often thought of as a nice to have, not a need to have. And that's why your clients are coming to you when they're feeling a great deal of pain when it's urgent, right? But in fact, it's important and it's a growth lever. And so therefore should be prioritized whether you feel like you have time for it or not. What else are you doing that has been statistically proven to grow your business at a rate that is two to three times probably your competition? Um, Yeah. Ooh, that's that's a really compelling statistic. I like that. I'm glad you shared that. Oof, man, that gives me a lot to think about. I hope everybody listening too. And we are just like a few minutes into our chat. So (laughs) you could just drop the microphone and walk away uh, right now. Um, But let's back up a couple of steps now that you've provided like a huge metric ton of value. Uh, I'd love to know how did you decide that customer interviews would be your area of specialization? This is a very specific niche. How did you get here? Uh, Shame in part. (laughs) When I started my marketing career, when I was a a junior in a corporate 25 odd years ago, Mm -hmm. I can't quite remember how it happened, but I was put in charge of a program uh, that marketers in the marketing team which was quite a big team maybe 50 people uh, I had to arrange a program for them to go and sit at our call center for at least an hour once a quarter and I set it up I was the face behind it I was the person that people complained to because they didn't want to do that they didn't have Mm -hmm. time it was a 40 minute taxi ride out to the call center and people came up with so many excuses not to do it Mm -hmm. and then every time somebody got that 40 minute taxi ride back from the call center they would come and seek me out saying thank you so much because (laughs) sitting down with a call center agent hearing what customers are saying about your campaign what issues they were having what they were confused about was just so eye-opening so very early on in my corporate career I learned the value of listening to your customers Um, Then I had other people do it for me in other corporate jobs. You know, we had research teams. I kind of forgot about research for about 17 17 years. (laughs) And then when I remembered and started doing it again, it was uh, like I'm not exaggerating to say my mind was blown by that first set of interviews because all of a sudden – this was now when I was working uh, with small businesses, instead of guessing using 20 years of experience, um, we were talking to the customers and finding out all those wonderful things like their wants and needs and challenges and hesitations and objections. So I started insisting on doing interviews with uh, my clients' customers and just absolutely loved it. And after a couple of years, Our summer in New Zealand is over Christmas, so we have December and January where not a lot happens, and I was thinking about things and realised the one thing, and this is a little bit shameful, but the one thing I never procrastinated about in my work was calling clients because I'm a curious person, I like people. I loved what I was learning, and 
as I started to make that more of what I was offering and people were responding, actually maybe I can make a go of this. Maybe I, this is what I can do. And I'm actually launching my new brand this week. So it's all happening and it's great. And I'm really excited by it. Congratulations on that, by the way. That's huge. And I'm sure the uh, work behind the scenes there was extremely significant. So that's really cool. Thank you. Okay, so how many years have you been doing customer interviews exclusively? Uh, about, well, I haven't been doing them exclusively, but four mm -hmm. years of customer interviews and then often helping people with their marketing. Awesome. That. And you've been in marketing, like we said earlier, for about 25 years, right? And so mm -hmm. you've seen you've seen it from every single different angle. I'm sure been on all different types of teams. We talked about, you worked at small businesses, you've worked at big corporations. And so I can imagine the, the breadth and depth of experience that you're able to draw on when you're doing these customer interviews is almost like magical. I bet you're creating a lot of magic, marketing magic for, for the clients that you're working with. Um, and so I'm curious, have you, how have you evolved your approach over the last four years of doing customer interviews at, at this stage of your career? I guess like anything, the more you do it, the more you practice it, the better you become. So mm -hmm. when I started out, I had a list of questions and I sat there. This was mostly phone calls back then because early clients, some of them were Older, there are people that aren't sitting in front of a computer for their work, so they okay. don't have Zoom. It was easy to make phone calls. Yeah. And so I would sit there with my phone on um, speaker mm -hmm. and my iPad recording the conversation with my pen and paper and questions and work through the questions. And I almost feel like that's probably what you have to do to start with. Mm -hmm. But if you just work through a list of questions and you're just waiting for them to answer this one before you ask the next one. Like I missed so much stuff mm -hmm. because I wasn't properly listening. And one of my first clients, and I'm again, still really regretful. Um, this was a financial services company and they're, the people that I spoke to were all mostly rural men who would have been 65 and older. And this company was paying an agency to for LinkedIn ads and for Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. And I'm working through my list of client uh, list of questions. And one of the questions at the end is, you know, where do you hang out? When what are you typically doing? I guess it's no surprise that rural men in their sixties weren't actually spending any time on LinkedIn, and they weren't on Facebook themselves, but they were on YouTube which was kind of mind-blowing to me because I'm not a rural person. I had no idea. Uh -huh. But I moved on to the next question. It never occurred to me to say, what are you actually looking at on YouTube? Mm. You know, are you watching old comedy shows? Are you watching tractor reviews? Which would have been really useful information for my client to know. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the evolution of the process, I have now gone from having a set list of questions to before I sit down for a call, I will have done some work with the client and on my own figuring out what are the things that we're actually trying to find out? What mm -hmm. are the key things that if I learn this from your clients are going to make a difference in your business down the track, are going to move the needle, are going to get that growth yes. and you know, bust through uh, that stalled period. So sit down. I just like hand scribble on my iPad a little bit of a map of what I think, uh, what I think I'm going to hear, what I'm expecting, what I want to learn. The only time I write down anything now is if somebody says something and I want to follow it up, but I also want to hear what, keep hearing what they're saying and I don't want to forget. Um, yeah. So recording calls for me is absolutely essential. I get them transcribed afterwards and go through the transcription really closely. And that's great for firstly, not taxing my memory, uh, but also one of the things that I love about this work is you get to hear your customers' own voices. So the transcripts tell me how your customers speak. I actually run a workshop sometimes called Steal From Your Customers, and it's essentially about stealing their exact words, yeah. 
If you use that in your social media posts or your website copy, you know, they feel heard and seen Mm -hmm. because you're speaking back to them using the same language. Mm -hmm. Like I had a great example of that, a client earlier this year, and they were a, a different financial services company. And I actually didn't pick it up when I was talking on the interviews themselves. But when I went through the transcripts, something that I found about their clients was that these people walked right up to the line of swearing and then would hold back. So, you know, their language was quite fruity and, you know, financial services companies, they're quite proper and staid and risk averse. But, you know, all their clients were nearly saying the F word and then saying, I can't say the F word, (laughs) things like that, which in the hands of a talented copywriter, Mm -hmm. because one of the things that I do is pull together a list of the really great things that people say. In the hands of a talented copywriter, like it's not out yet, but she's turned this stepping up to the line of swearing into a really fantastic campaign, which I'm sure will do well. But by having the transcripts, you get the richness of the language, you're understanding the real people. Sorry, I think I got that off topic there. Amanda. No, that's great. And that's so, uh, that's such an important point. Like you could never get that from a multiple choice survey. Never in a million no. years could you get that. But how incredibly valuable and really surprised your client as well, um, that maybe they need to have a little bit more levity and, and playfulness, potentially edge, you know, in their, in their marketing campaigns and copywriting overall. So, I mean, that's incredibly valuable, but yeah, we want to be such good listeners so that we can be the marketer that, you know, it seems like someone you're looking at a web page or a LinkedIn post or whatever the case may be listening to a podcast. It's like someone reached into my brain, stole a phrase from it and has put it right here in front of me in black and white to read like they get me. They really, really get me. Um, but you can't achieve that level of marketing excellence absent this kind of really important qualitative research. And I know you just gave a couple examples of this, but I'm wondering about your most memorable calls uh, you've had on behalf of your clients over the past four years ago. And you've talked about a couple examples of, you know, gleaning specific insights, but anything particularly uh, funny or noteworthy. There are a couple that stand out, and one of the first clients that I did this work for was a organic skincare company here in New Zealand called Love Skin. Extraordinary product. I'd done about eight interviews. Every single person that I spoke to at some stage on the call said, started using Love Skin, and within a month, uh, people were saying, what are you doing? You look so much younger. So I was kind of mm-hmm. expecting that from calls. And then I made this call and I was speaking to this lady. She was a mum in her 30s and she had had a brain tumour and she had had brain surgery. So she needed to be really careful about what she was putting on her body and what the ingredients were. So she'd done a lot of research, which is how she came to my client. And she was talking about how This product made her feel and that her scarring, you know, this was the first product that she had felt comfortable touching her brain brain surgery scars. And that was like so moving and feeling like I'm a little part of a company. Well, A, I get to tell that story to my client, which is really Mm -hmm. emotional But B, you know, I'm part of something that has that kind of effect Mm -hmm. on somebody. That was quite extraordinary. And I had another one which I tell people about quite a lot because when you say to a client, and I find it more with B2B clients, but when you say, you know, the interviews are generally going to be 30 to 45 minutes because that's what it takes to get some really good insights. And especially these B2B clients, they'll say, oh, my people are too busy. They won't talk for that long. And I tell them about, wasn't B2B, but I spoke to a Canadian lady. This was for a tourism company in New Zealand. She'd been, she'd used the company, she'd agreed to an interview. But you know how Canadians are all lovely 
these people were so lovely they would win nicest Canadians as judged by <laughs> Canadians. It was so sweet. She put her phone on speaker and she was in the kitchen and every now and again her husband would chip in. So I got some really lovely, it was a really lovely conversation, got some really lovely data. We got to about 38 minutes and I felt that, you know, everything on my um, map, I'd learned what I needed to know. So I started to wrap up the conversation and she said, oh, oh, can I just tell you one more story? So she told me another story. And we're now at about 43 minutes and I'm starting to wrap up. And she goes, oh, oh, please, please, just one more. And I tell my (laughs) clients that because, yes, people are busy and, yes, potentially 30 to 45 minutes sounds like Mm -hmm. a lot of time, but people like to be heard. Like when in your life have you, are you going to have somebody hanging off every single word for 30 to 45 minutes while while you talk through your buying (laughs) process and stuff. Like it doesn't necessarily sound like the most Mm -hmm. captivating thing to listen to, but I am genuinely really, really interested. And people love talking, even sometimes, sometimes to compromise, I say 20 to 30 minutes and even the ones that have said I can only spare 20 minutes. You know, sometimes they do. But other times they talk, it goes on for 25, 28, mm-hmm. 30 because somebody's yes. listening to them. It doesn't happen in today's world. Yes, that hits so deeply at the core of our foundational desires and our need to be, um, to feel like we belong and like we are important and respected um, yeah, and heard. I mean, that's, that's incredible. And that is the most important piece of marketing, in my opinion, we talk a lot about value outcomes and transformation. And the transformation piece is at the the core of like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's the transformation from an undesired state to a desired state, to a foundational desire. So I'm thinking back to the woman with the scar from her brain surgery, and maybe she was in a place of shame, discomfort, uh, unconfidence, lacking confidence, and that product took her to a place of maybe beauty, comfort, and confidence. And man, are those things that will help you sell a good product, right? And so that's so, 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 so important. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. And again, things that you cannot get nearly as well from any kind of multiple choice survey. So, cool. Yeah. And we've already touched on this quite a bit. I just want to make sure if you have anything to add, you have the opportunity to how do customer interviews help business owners with things, not just marketing. We've talked a lot about how it helps with marketing and, and, you know, feeding that customer voice of customer words and phrases and specifics back into all of our marketing assets. But how do these customer interviews help with strategic decision-making? For me, it's about actually having data but not boring data in a dashboard it's by understanding the humans beyond the marketing data um you're not guessing you're not making assumptions you're not look at looking at what somebody else is doing you're figuring out what works exactly right for you and i've got a very recent example i have just been doing some just completed some interviews for a startup they're a well-funded startup but they're Mm -hmm. completely new. So they did some work with a branding agency. Like it it looks like it was quite comprehensive when they were getting started. They all sat round tables and doing workshops and figured out their point of difference and they have developed their whole brand on this Mm -hmm. point of difference and it's a really, really distinctive point of difference. Nine interviews, you know, 18 months on, nine interviews with their customers. Yes, that is a point of difference. Yes, nobody else offers it, but nobody cares about that point of difference. It's actually not something Mm. that they value, or at least it's not in the top five. Maybe it was coming in at six or seven. So, you know, all Mm. this work has been done, and you can't argue that it's a point of difference, but it's not something that matters. So 
I don't know whether you've ever done those exercises sometimes when you're coaching or people are telling you about personal brand. They say, ask five people, what is it about Amanda that stands out? You know, tell us uh, some stories about Amanda and you kind of learn something that you don't necessarily realise people perceive mm -hmm. of you. It's the same with the business. There's an, I find there's enormous value. One of the questions that I like to ask near an end of an interview is, how would you describe what Level Up Creators does to a friend? And if you, if you can hear what people think of your own business in their own words, like you might be aghast, you might be surprised, or you might actually think, wow, that's not actually something we've thought about and can be something really useful in our business development going forward. Yeah. Yes. So much so. Okay, well, let's get into some nitty gritties as we're kind of like passing the halfway point in the call for marketers and business owner business owners who want to kind of go at this process alone and make make it a ritual part of what they do in their day to day work. Could you walk us through the process of getting clients to actually agree to a call? How do you prepare for the call? Uh, getting customers to show up for the call, and then of course, like. What do you say to glean the most important, impactful insights while being respective of your client's time? I guess the first thing I would say is my philosophy is to talk to your best clients, the ones that you love, the ones that love you, because if you can understand them really well, you're going to attract more people like them. So rather than just ask random clients, you know, you might have somebody that doesn't pay their bills or doesn't really like you. But if you can understand the ones that you love and love you back, then that puts you in a really strong position. So the first thing I'd say is, you know, be really thoughtful on who mm -hmm. you want to talk to. Uh, then depending on your business and the type of relationship, if there's somebody that's you know, if you've either got a sales team or you know them personally, if there's a personal relationship, then it's a lot easier to get an interview with a personal, you know, you can either give them a call or an email, hey, we're looking to, you know, you can phrase it however you want, yeah. whatever your hoped for outcomes are. We're hoping to improve our business. We're hoping to learn more about people like you because we want to be even better at what we do. Um, generally, I have found that people are willing to help. In some instances, like I don't offer an incentive straight away, but sometimes, you know, if we've emailed 10 people and only two have replied and we've followed up a couple of times, then maybe, uh, you know, depending on what it is, a $50 mm -hmm. Amazon voucher or a you know, Starbucks, yeah. whatever, might shift the needle. But generally I find if you've got a good relationship, personal relationship, that's easy to do. If you're in a bigger organization, like sometimes it is a little bit of a spray and pray, let's look at some um, metrics and try our best. So uh, sending an email, one thing that I'm really careful that my clients do because I get them to send the emails in the first place is making sure that they know it's not a sales. Mm. So there's no mm. sales pitch, you're there to listen. Um, that no preps required, so they don't. There's nothing to be nervous about. It's not even an interview, really. I phrase it more as just a, a conversation, getting to know you uh, a little bit better. Also, try and make the point, and this would be really important if you're doing them in house, is that you know we really want you to be honest. We really want you to hold back. You're not going to be hurting our feelings. You're going to be helping us. So finding a way to express that before you start. Um, I use a Calendly link, so all the confirmations come through and I very rarely have somebody miss a call, so people do nice. tend to show up. In terms of prep, I would spend some time thinking about what you're trying to get out of the interview. What's the most useful information for you to learn in order to be able to, you know, think that this is a worthwhile thing. And sometimes that might mean prioritising it because 
you know, sometimes you will get on a call and somebody has said, yep, 30 minutes is fine, and then say, actually, I have to pick up my kid from school early, so I've only got 10 minutes. So you want to think about what are the things Mm -hmm. that you want to learn. And that's one of the things that when I kick off, you know, try and do a little bit of rapport building. And one of the things that I do check in with is, hey, we've got this scheduled for between 30 and 45 minutes. Is this still good for you? Do you have a hard stop? So that they feel like their time is being respected. But very much um, figure out before you start what it is that is most useful for you to learn. Um, And then in terms of questions, I generally start with a a version of something like, so what was going on in your life that made you buy this, made you look Mm -hmm. at our product or service, just to get, um, (laughs) to figure out what was going on in their life. I, depending on the person, if they are not, Like every now and again, you get somebody who gives you one word answers, which is not necessarily the most useful (laughs) thing. So sometimes I, depending on how I judge their tolerance for silliness, I might say, look, pretending, pretend I'm making a documentary about your decision to hire so-and-so. And so I might ask you things that don't seem necessarily relevant to you, but they're just helping me build a picture. So that kind of gives you a bit of an excuse to ask things that they may um, may not understand why. But yeah, so what is it that was going on in your life? Uh, quite often I really like to figure out the funnel or the, the buyer journey because obviously down the track that's so useful for understanding how and where to yes. market to people. Um, so ask questions around the buyer journey. What? How did you go about? your search can you talk me through you know even down to details sometimes that help like were you doing that on your phone at the breakfast table or were you at work sitting on your computer doing that google search so finding out um teasing out as much as i can of the buyer journey so i can do a journey map afterwards um and then obviously the outcomes so how is life better now that you're using this or have bought this or Mm -hmm. what can you do now that you couldn't do before depending on the client sometimes I like to push for like can you give me some actual data can you say yes since doing this our revenue has increased Mm -hmm. two percent or churn has reduced by this or whatever the the thing is quite often that's not doable but it is worth the ask because every now and again somebody will say we have mm-hmm. got that data somewhere I can mm-hmm. send it through to you and as you know it's great to be able to have those numbers and yes. testimonials and case studies um and then there's two other questions there's a new one actually that I've just started asking in the last couple of months that has been yielding me some really great answers and that is if this was your business what would you do differently And I like that because I get some really good answers, but also it's basically the flip side of saying what could they do better or what's your Mm -hmm. criticism. And if somebody doesn't, you know, if they like the company and they like the people and they don't, they're not comfortable feeling like they're criticising, but flipping it by saying what would you do differently in their shoes um, opens that up for any number of learnings and then a question that I almost always pretty much finish up with is if you had a friend or a colleague and you thought they would really benefit from this service Mm -hmm. this product but you only had 30 seconds to convince them what would you say to them Now, I think in all the time that I've been asking that question, I maybe have had three people that have stuck to 30 seconds, which is absolutely (laughs) fine. Uh, The reason I used to ask that without the 30 seconds and the reason that I put the 30 seconds in is because it forces people to Mm self-edit and pretty much the first thing they say to you is going to be 
the most important thing. But when I had that as an open-ended question, it was still really good information, but it rambled. And now the 30 seconds means right up front, they give me the goods and it's really, really good to know. So those are probably some of the core questions that I ask every single time. Those are such great questions. And so much of business is the art of questioning. I mean, interviewing, hiring, um, crafting a good onboarding experience for new employees, for new customers. Um, oh my God. I mean, it's just infinite. Like if you can ask good questions, you can be an excellent leader. If you can ask the questions that can help your employees reach their own intelligent conclusions. And the way that you craft questions is so unbelievably important. I mean, that opening question, what was happening in your life? That opens up so many possibilities and it doesn't, immediately narrow the focus, just like the last question is intended to narrow focus and get the goods right out of the gate there. But at the beginning, you're not swaying their response by saying what was going wrong in your life or what problem were you experiencing, right? You're, you're allowing, um, for something very open-ended, but it's like this very intentional craft. I mean, you are taking people on this call on a customer journey and it starts with that first, how you position what the call is going to be like to lower the barrier to entry, to lower their guard. And you have automated systems with Calendly and reminders to get people to show up. You said sometimes you have to offer incentives. But I think the potentially big takeaway here is set the stage for a warm, friendly, zero stakes, no sales pitch call, and then really pay attention to how you craft your questions and also knowing, you know, where the business is at, where the business wants to be, what they're trying, what they've tried so far to get to where they want to go um, and what they think is keeping them from getting there. And then you can test, you know, those hypotheses with the questions that you're asking and kind of match the answers up with what they're trying. So, I mean, that's a huge strategic piece of the business because we can sit in a boardroom or in a room by yourself or at a coffee shop or wherever you are in whatever stage of business. And we can guess all day. Um, But at the end of the day, we don't want to be this like crazy, well-funded startup 18 months in, and we've put all our chips on the table on the wrong bet. Mm. (laughs) So (laughs) I like what you said at the beginning um, of our chat today about when do you start yesterday, today, you know, should have already started doing this. I think that's really, we're, we're building a strong case for customer interviews. I feel like throughout here, um, you're an incredibly, uh, effective interviewer. I mean, the, the insights that you're sharing that you've been able to, to capture for your clients and then communicate them to your clients. That's so, so powerful. Um, okay. And so let me make sure we're prioritizing here. We got about 10 minutes left. One big question how do you know which feedback to act on versus which feedback you should ignore? Um, so now I'm just going to reverse everything that I've said <laughs> so far <laughs> because a lot of it is gut feel and experience. Mm. So what I should have said first is, you know, one interview is great, two interviews is better. You get to a stage and depending on the business and the the choice of people that you've recruited that comes anywhere between four to six interviews up to like nine to 12, but there comes a stage where you start hearing the Mm -hmm. same things over and over and you've kind of exhausted learning anything new. So obviously that's one way to tell you whether the feedback is valid or not. If everybody's telling it to you, then it's kind of a no brainer, but every now and again, you will hear something. And I can't remember the exact details, but I remember last year there was one interviewee out of about 15 said something. It wasn't echoed by anyone else, but, and probably it's that 25 years of marketing experience behind me, I thought that it was at least worth flagging Mm. with the client. You know, it's only one person, but this was said, and I feel like that's indicating this opportunity. but. It is just one person. So that's when, you know, you rely on your experience, your gut feel, and I guess the consequences. What are the consequences Mm -hmm. of acting on that? You know, can you do some A-B testing? It might be worth a punt, and if it works, it works, and if it doesn't, um, but, yeah, go with your gut if in doubt. So experience, looking for trends, but then occasionally those are, there are outliers. And I would think, like, really having a solid 
a handle on again, like where you are, where you're going and what would help you get where you want to go. That is tough. I mean, I come from Silicon Valley, like tech software world and the number of feature requests that come in to the customer success team. I mean, it is so hard if you don't have that level of specificity in terms of like mission, vision, values, where we're taking this thing, um, what to do and what not to do. So I think that's really, really worth kind of double clicking on today uh, because the discernment piece is ultimately probably going to like make or break the value of your customer interviews. Is that fair to say, or is that a little strong? Definitely plays a part. Like I couldn't have done this when I had been in marketing for two years because I wouldn't have the broader context. And also, you know, age helps, you know, put the marketing stuff aside, but, you know, I've got a couple of decades of adulthood Mm -hmm. behind me and understand people more than I did in my early 20s. Um, So I think discernment does play a part. But ultimately, too, it's your business. You don't want to necessarily... You don't want to necessarily hear stuff that is indicating that your business should entirely change if it's not something that, you know, your heart resonates Mm -hmm. with. So there's a balance to be had and it's just finding a happy Mm -hmm. balance. But if you don't talk to the customers, then you're – I used to share an office with a photographer and – I used to talk to her about it and she said, if you're not talking to your customers, it's like trying to take a great photo in the dark. Mm. The info is there, but you don't have the ability to Mm. see it properly. So, you know, whether it's your marketing with one hand tied behind your back or you're trying to take photos in the dark, you've got a blind spot if you're not including your customers in the conversations that you're having around the board table or the the exec team. You know, there's a lot of businesses out there that claim they're customer centric and don't actually talk to their customers. Irony of ironies. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there are some inherent advantages in having an outside party conduct customer interviews. There's a lot of importance, like don't let this be a barrier to entry for you, business owner listening, but you know, there's some inherent bias that you have to overcome if you're the business owner or marketer that works at the business and people don't want to hurt your feelings. So, you know, there's kind of a hurdle to overcome to get real feedback in that regard, plus the experience, intuition, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I mean, someone like Catherine has been in so many different businesses, has so much experience um, and is able to cherry pick with like surgical level of precision, like what the important pieces of those interviews are. And also coming back to like crafting the right questions, asking them in the right order, giving people permission to answer freely and answer questions that may seem a little bit off the wall or potentially irrelevant from their perspective. Uh, So I think there's a lot of value in at least intermittently having an outside party uh, come in and do the interviews and also just have an outside pair of experienced eyes looking in on your business. I mean, that's the power of like hiring consultants and coaches as well to help get you unstuck. And this is just a very specific way to get you unstuck. Um, so what's it like to work with you? How does, how does your process work? Um, hopefully it's fun. I, we start off with the kickoff means I interview your team. So any stakeholders, because it's really interesting and important for me to understand the business Mm -hmm. really well, because if I'm going into a set of client interviews and I don't really understand your business, I'm clearly not going to get the the best insights from that. Um, So the purpose of those interviews is twofold, to understand the business, but to also understand what it is that you think you know about Mm. your customers. Mostly that's selfish, so at the end I can go, aha, this is what we've learned. You were wrong or you missed that. Um, But it's quite useful to try and extract Mm -hmm. that information. So we do the kickoff, then um, the the client will arrange the scheduling, obviously with my help, but arrange the scheduling, do the interviews. Generally, I will ring you or email uh, my client after the first interview because I'm overexcited about all the things <laughs> that I've learned from just one interview. So, 
Oops, you wouldn't believe this. Um, and then, so depending on the number of people I'm talking to, this can cover off sort of a week to three or four weeks of interviews. But during that stage, every Monday, I send an interview saying, this is what happened last week. This is what's coming up. So people always know where they're at. And as we move through, it's like, Here's some aha moments, like give them little teasers of nice. what I've learned. Uh, then once all the interviews are done, I put my head down and this is where the, the broader experience becomes really useful. This is where I do the analysis. Mm -hmm. So what are the themes that I'm seeing emerging? What are the, the great verbatim quotes that I want to uh, refer back on to you? Put it all together in a report, which I then go and present to the team, I used to, uh, sometimes I do that in two parts. Sometimes I take virtual tissues because like a week ago I made two customers cry when I was reporting back to them. Oh. Happy tears because, you know, sometimes incredibly wonderful and talented people are completely oblivious to how wonderful and talented mm. they are and how much their customers appreciate them. And so I do have a slide that I sometimes use that say, do you need tissues? Because when you're, look, most of my clients are absolutely brilliant. So I've got really good things mm -hmm. to feed back. But when people have heard, you know, 30 slides and I pull out verbatim, so every point I make is backed up by what yeah. somebody has said. When you've been listening to that for 45 minutes about how wonderful you are, it can be a little bit over. Yeah. And then a week or so after the presentation, there's an opportunity if they want to have another session to talk through the findings once they've had a chance mm -hmm. to digest them. Uh, and I also produce some written reports. So I don't believe in customer personas because I think they are a nice fictional device that's not necessarily all that useful. So I produce what I call a real mm -hmm. customer profile that lists things that the customers have actually told me. So they get that, they get a buyer journey, they get some recommendations. And even though I love writing 30 page reports, I was told very early on that nobody wants to read them, which is very sad <laughs> for me. But so everything is, you know, try and put as much as I can on one page. So they only end up with about five pages uh, of data at the end. Man, what a gift to be able to give someone who, like you're saying, maybe has not been told how amazing or brilliant or wonderful or impactful that they uh -huh. are. That's really, really got to be so incredibly rewarding for you um, and for the person on the receiving end of that. Cool. Well, yeah. you've crafted a lovely customer journey uh, that you take your clients on. So thank you. That was very helpful and insightful. And yeah, I agree. I also tend to like to overwrite, but it's like, straight into the point when you're talking to a business owner. So <laughs> that's cool. Um, all right. Well, just to make sure we wrap up our chat today, the nice little bow or a cherry on top, are there any do's and or don't do's of customer interviews that we haven't covered yet? I would love to give uh, two bits of advice to anybody thinking of doing customer interviews and well, three bits of advice. One is to listen. Like it took me a little while to learn actually how to listen properly. And I, you know, I thought I was a listener and I, I wasn't really. I was a listen while in the back of my head is what I'm going to say next. Um, so actually really listen. Try and really listen to what people are saying. Uh, don't, and this was the hardest thing for me to learn, tolerate awkward silences. So, you know, when you ask somebody a question and they don't answer, my instinct is to, to help them or to say something to ask it a different way. And if you can learn to sit with 10 seconds of silence is excruciating. <laughs> but sometimes that just means that they are going to say something really great. So learn to live with awkward silences. Practice them if you have to because they're really terrible but they're absolutely worth it. And don't be scared to ask dumb questions. In fact, sometimes that's part of my preamble. I might ask you questions that you think are really 
basic and simple. And sometimes for me, that's around industry mm. terms that I don't understand or industry references. I'm not scared to play dumb. But even things like, say somebody said, um, I'm, I'm really busy, and they go on to say something, can you tell me what busy looks like for you? Because busy for me might mean, you know, might be a five when your busy is the level 10. So just making sure that you understand those things. And something that I do a lot, you try not to put words in people's mouths, so you don't want to answer for them. But if somebody asks a que answers a question, sometimes I just repeat it back to them, essentially saying, so can I just check that I've understood this correctly? You're saying X, Y, Z. And they'll either agree or not, but most of the time they say something else and quite often there's gold in their further explanation when you're just checking that. But yeah, just listen and be curious. Be curious. Yes. I think you are an insatiably curious person, Catherine, and there's so much value in that. No matter what you're doing, uh, I think that's a beautiful way to live life. Thank you again for joining me today, Catherine. I enjoyed the conversation so much. I mean, you shared so much value. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you have a quick parting shot and where can listeners find you online? Uh, online, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, just under my name, Catherine McGarvey. And the parting shot would be, please talk to your customers. You're, you'll be amazed at what you learn. And if you do talk to some customers, I'd love it if you connected on LinkedIn and sent me a DM saying what, how you found it. It would be brilliant. But yeah, absolutely do it. You won't awesome. regret it. Thank you again, Catherine. And thank you, listeners. We know that time is precious. Thank you for sharing yours with us. We help creators like you at levelupcreatorschool.com, where our team becomes your full stack team of advisors and also includes no fluff creator courses, a vibrant creator community, and more all on a subscription basis. See the show notes for more information and a suite of high value free resources. See you next time on the Level Up Creators podcast. All right.